What's up, weirdos? I'm Felicia, and I like scary movies. And today I am at the offices of Glass Eye Picks in New York City. And I'm here with Larry Fezenden, who just put out a pretty cool movie called Depraved. It's right there. What? Did you find that? No. <laughs> Rigo found it for me. <laughs> nice. <laughs> um, so I guess my first question, we just chatted a little bit before we started, but uh, that you went to NYU and have been in New York ever since. No, no, I was born in the New York hospital. I've been here my whole life, except for a couple of years I went to a high school out of town. That's great. I feel like I don't know, I rarely meet people that are from here. It's true. It's so a mostly very people specific that thing. came yeah. here. And I'm also from Manhattan, so that's different too. That's even more specific. Exactly. That's yeah. crazy. Yeah. Why have you stayed here? Like, what about New York? New York uh, is a lot, it's really present as a character in your films. I'm curious. Yeah. I mean, I love the city. I loved seeing it. Uh, change now it's getting a little too gentrified but uh, there's change always change. nooks and crannies you can find it's still got a lot of character and I love that it's always uh, awake always busy they're great communities you can get you know do offbeat things and I grew up Absolutely. Uh, in the 80s there was performance art and lots of fun stuff and music and CBGB's all of that all so, right around here you exactly, stayed in the same yeah. exact area yeah well i moved down here in 81 or something which nice. was well, i was at nyu an undergraduate uh and i uh, really got absorbed into the neighborhood Tompkins square and all that there were riots you know it was oh, yeah. all very dramatic so it's gone on. now <laughs> it, then it sort of gentrified along with my life because i had a kid and so now oh, Tompkins square was a nice place to raise your kid and stuff yeah and <laughs> not just for drugs anymore exactly mm. what are you gonna what do what a bummer <laughs> yeah so uh, it's all good but i love the city i mean now i tend to try to get out of the city i have a place upstate which uh, nice. made a lot of movies there nice yeah like which ones curious well, it's a pretty crazy list. But anyway, uh, <laughs> Wendigo, yep. uh, Bitter Feast. Um, uh, we made Stakeland out of there. And, you know, uh, Stray Bullets, Foxhole, Deprave shot up there. The Ranger shot up there. Man, uh, that's so, a pretty good list. <laughs> yeah, oh, and it goes on all kinds of music videos and stuff. It's just a nice property where we have a bunch of crap in the barn. And, uh, nice. you know, people come up and have their way with it make something mm -hmm. so you do a lot of things turns out <laughs> your, your imdb uh, page has a lot of categories of things that you do yeah. um you pretty much worked on every s sort of job you could do on film mm -hmm. right yeah uh what is, is there something that you prefer to do do you just love filmmaking in general and you want to do all these different jobs because you do a lot of things even on your own films right I just, I do love filmmaking. I, that's why I do it, because I don't love agents and trying to get the money and all that part. It's really a heartbreak. But mm -hmm. uh, I love putting images together. And, uh, you know, my favorite part is editing. And it's because oh, you've cool. been through whatever you've been through. Now the material speaks to you and you get wildly right. creative and you tell whole new stories you didn't know were in your, in your yeah. you know. Uh, so uh, I really love that. But I started as an actor, so I enjoy that. But. All those things have stresses, performance stresses. Mm, for sure. Editing, you're on your own, and you're in sort of a more zen place. So yeah, that's my vibe. I didn't, I didn't go to school for film, as many of you probably know. But <laughs> um, <laughs> look at that shot. Look at this. Looks not, great. Not you didn't go for lighting. That's for clear. no, that's definitely not. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I have uh, read or understood that. You know, a movie is it's the, it's got the script version, which is one yeah. version of the movie. It's got the shooting version, another version. Editing is a totally different movie That's potentially right. than what you started with. That's a classic. Uh, I quote that as well. Oh, you, you, know, you make your movie three times. <laughs> oh, nice. Yeah, you know, yeah. When you write it, you have all the aspirations. You also have no budget concerns, right. no time concerns. All the acting is perfect. It's just how you imagine it. In production. It's it's a bit of a heartbreak because you leave behind the script, but mm -hmm. you gain by having new collaborators and people giving advice yeah. and actors that bring lines out in ways you never knew, so that's all good. Still, there's a lot of things that can go wrong, and yeah. some things do. When you edit, you really need to have a clean slate, and that's why the real advice is to get someone else to edit your movie because <laughs> they don't have any of the heartbreak of like, oh, right. we had that crane shot, we have to use it no matter what. Because it was so hard. Yeah, because it was so hard. <laughs> and, you know, a normal editor will say, I don't care. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work in the story. we yeah. got to skip that. So one movie I made in 1991 called No Telling, I had three crane shots, and they were budget busters. They mm. took all day. I cut all three of them. Wow. <laughs> so you're, and you edited now, that one yourself? 
No, I actually had an editor. Okay. And it was, um, it was a very uptight experience, and I knew I just wanted to get in there and sort of let the material talk to me mm-hmm. rather than talk about it with someone. So that's kind of when I decided I really need to edit. And I, I had edited everything up to there, and I had edited four friends. So, I okay. mean... But there's this notion, oh, the third eye, you know, you need uh, uh, somebody to come in. Uh, and it's advice I would still give, but for myself, it's not uh, how I relate to the material. I really like yeah. to get in there and work on it myself. So uh, in terms of Depraved, which is here again, uh, it's a modern Frankenstein tale, if you will. Uh-huh. Um, how did that go from a script to final edit? Like, what was the big changes that happened through that? Well, that's a funny question. I had written this script a long time ago. I don't know. I don't even remember the process, but I love Frankenstein ever since I was little, so cool. it was sort of percolating. And the, what, what I do with my movies is I sort of take these old classic stories yeah. and bring them to a, a modern sensibility. I mm-hmm. like putting them right today, not, not, yeah. you know, not in the 80s or before cell phones and all those kind of things people <laughs> do. I like it to be like, what would it be like right now? What would the Frankenstein right. story be like? Or... Or what would the uh, Dracula story? You exactly. Know, vampire. Yeah. So that's sort of what I've always tried to do, and um, so I had the script for a long time. I was trying to get famous actors and all mm. of those things that mm-hmm. you do to get the money, and oh, it just sure. it never worked out. Uh, I think you know either Frankenstein seemed like an incredibly old-fashioned or just sort of an overused thing. Maybe they felt that uh, the recent Frankenstein's weren't successful, like I Frankenstein with mm-hmm. Eckert and. Uh, uh, Victor Frankenstein. Anyway, they they didn't know how to do it right, but they certainly weren't going to give me a shot. Mm-hmm. So eventually, I just said, you know, I'll do it myself, and I hired local actors. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you got we some did good a, ones. a low budget version. I mean, it still looks great nowadays. You can shoot a really good looking movie with these new uh, digital equipment, Absolutely. and um, that's the deal. It didn't change a lot. Uh, production was great because the actors were bringing new vitality to the to the lines and everything and it was a great collaboration all the people and then I edited myself and I had a cut like in a, a couple of weeks and then it took me a year to finish you know mm-hmm. always you have to sort of but I, I didn't make radical cuts to it um, I felt that this was a big story that really could take its time and some people might find it's too long but I I really couldn't lose anything so it wasn't a radical edit you know, and I have done that. That's fun too when you just realize, you know, I need to move this scene over to here. And yeah, I've yeah. done that as a producer. I've, I have one story. Uh, I had a friend, he finished his movie, it was great. We saw it in a festival. Okay. And I was like, that, that feels so weird. I said, Joe, do you mind if I meet me in a bar? <laughs> we met in a bar. I and I, I, I had a DVD that I'd made where I'd switched. The, a whole chunk of the movie earlier. Oh, wow. And uh, I gave it to him. I said, just just watch this. I mean, no pressure. Um, we're done. But I just have this inkling. And indeed, he, he saw it. And he, and he was like, you're right. And it was like a secondary character whose story was... We were done with it. We were ready to move yeah. on. And uh, it was fun. We just made the change. And that's the version, the real version. So That's cool. You never know what's going to happen. Yeah, yeah. you got to let the movie talk to you. That's the real lesson of editing. For sure. Um, I said, my next question about Depraved is that, so I noticed when I saw it, there's a lot of, like, oh, it's the past Frankenstein tellings, and, like, you got the, the black and white, you have the lightning, the big stomping, course, all this kind of stuff. Stomping. It's important, it's important. <laughs> but uh, I guess what what were... What were all the movies you were pulling from or or whatever to, like, put into... The, which ones were the most important for you? Well, the Karloff version is my favorite. That's so. from 1931, and then they made, you know, two more with him. And you can see he's getting fatter each year because uh, <laughs> he was finally on, on a real salary. Um, but the first one has a real magic, and it's very spare. And then, you know, you can't uh, think about Frankenstein without the uh, Christopher Lee ones, mm. which were from the 60s. Um, then there was one that affected me when I was a kid called Frankenstein, the true story, and that was like a TV oh, you know, four-hour-long thing, and uh, that one had the idea of educating the creature, so in a way I did borrow from that. Nice. Um, and then there's all sorts of obscure ones, Spirit of the Beehive, Gods and Monsters. These are movies sort of with Frankenstein uh, in them. 
Uh, there's a great one with Benedict Cumberbatch, which is uh-huh. a play that was directed by Danny Boyle, and you can sometimes see the video we'll play it. presented. Uh, it was Frankenstein. It was in England. Oh, nice. And, nice. and you know, you can't find it, but maybe it's... Every now and again, it plays in an art house in New York. But gotcha. that's so cool. I mean, yeah. it's Benedict Cumberbatch as the monster, and it's That fantastic. is really cool. So whatever. I don't know. I, the One of the reasons I was confident and determined to make Depraved is that I actually didn't particularly like a lot of the Frankensteins after the early ones. Um, you know, there's this idea of modernizing it without really, I think, getting at the, the themes that make it timeless. So I thought I had a shot. But the, I have a mashup. On YouTube. Okay. For all your fans. Um, I'll link it in the description. Yeah, it's called uh, <laughs> Pheasant and Frankenstein Mashup. And it's 25 Frankenstein movies just cut together in like a three minute piece where you nice. sort of follow the story. And, you know, That's there's cool. De Niro, of course, I forgot about him. There was that version. Uh, and I just did a redo of it. That's been around since 2012, but I just mm-hmm. added Depraved. Nice. So, there you go. Which, which section of Depraved did you use? Well, that's the point. I follow the story, like from the creation, and you yeah. see different versions, and Andy Warhol's version, and oh, all yeah. of that. Uh, and you go through, and Young Frankenstein, of course, mm. is a great uh, version of Frankenstein, even though it's a comedy. <laughs> uh, anyway, and then I just put uh, Depraved, sprinkled it in. It was fun. That's awesome. I think we measure up. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to watch that as soon as I leave here. Yeah, check it out. Uh, so, how did Glass Eye Picks come about? I'm here in the office. It's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Met some of your minions upstairs. Yeah, the minions. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of minions that have come through here, and I'm most proud of the fact that a lot of them have become famous or at least working filmmakers. And yeah. And that's sort of part of the mission, although it's exhausting, and I keep trying to turn that mission off and follow my own lead. But, mm. you know... Uh, I love all kinds of movies and all kinds of horror movies, but I have my own style. So it doesn't mean I don't want those other visions out there. So I've always Mm. encouraged people like, oh, come on, you can do that. Oh, that's great. So that has led over time to sort of a producerial role. And for a while I had access to money. And so I would say, well, we'll have this guy do that. And it's sort of this uh, grand manipulator but in a weird way it's like editing you know you're sort of finding Mm. the natural rhythm where the pieces go and this director would be so good at that and won't that be cool and I had a director the one whose movie I changed you know we had a slate of movies and he had always worked like made movies for five thousand dollars that sold so I gave him this assignment he didn't make horror movies but I said Joe I bet you have a horror (laughs) movie in you and he did so we made a really low budget movie in that did well and sold it, you know, Best Buy and all that. So, oh, okay. Ty West, yeah, somebody, that's, that's uh, the name I... yeah, of course. Yeah. Well, he's a beloved filmmaker, and really, um, he was my intern. And you know, it's incredible. Uh, I told him I really liked the short films he'd made at school, SVA in New York, and uh, I said, you know, if you graduate and you have any ideas for a feature, maybe maybe we can make it. Because I knew that he was incredibly disciplined, sharp, and he could mm-hmm. make a real movie for very little money. Yeah. So we did that. And from Ty, you know, I met Graham Resnick and, and Peter Polk and all these people who became producers. And uh, um, for Ty's movie, we needed uh, Killer Bats. So we met a CGI company back when that was really oh, okay. a new thing. Yeah. Um, and that guy became uh, Glenn McQuaid. We made a movie with him. So... We just, it was sort of a steamroller where we could figure out ways to make the next one. We were always sort of shuffling money around and figuring it out. And in the old days, you could sell to, like, DVD and Mm -hmm. Blu-ray and uh, make your money back, or even more. And so I got into this uh, addictive uh, cycle of putting that money back into the next movie. And as a result, we have a huge roster of films. And And still coming. We keep trying. (laughs) We made... uh, most Beautiful Island, Like Me, The Ranger, all of those. I just saw The, the Ranger. Yeah, that's cool that's badass. Yeah, that's really yeah. cool. I really, yeah. And very that. different from The Prey. That's totally. the thing. You know, horror can be so many different things. It can be a badass punk movie that's yeah. got a, a lot of colors and a real sort of a, um, a great uh, lead actress sort of um, redefining, you know, the final girl, all those Who's cliches. Also? Oh, yeah, she's girl, also right? Chloe, Chloe yes. Levine. Yeah, she's great. She's in a really cool movie called Transfiguration, which I was in 
for one little cameo. I always do cameos where I get killed. <laughs> There's also a death reel on YouTube. Yo, YouTube. Um, Linked in the, the description. Larry, we'll find it. Larry <laughs> Fessenden death reel. That's pretty fun, mm-hmm. even though I have to update it because I've died many times. Since. <laughs> um, so that's, uh, the, you know, we, we make comic books. We make, uh, we love uh, music and soundtracks for a long time. That was a, a thing you could really put out and um yeah and then you know i wrote a video game called until dawn with my friend graham i saw a few video game credits i was intrigued by that which is weird because i'm not really a gamer but (laughs) but it's the idea of using this sort of um naturalistic approach to horror Uh and this company in the uk just took an interest in that um in the films that we'd been making and sort of asked me to consider writing this with that same approach sort mm-hmm. of character driven yeah was yeah. the idea and uh, yeah so me and graham had quite a run of it we just had a game come out recently called uh, man of medan so cool i'm not a gamer either but i am fascinated by the idea of uh you'd be able to make choices i love that you say that that's exactly yeah, my approach i'm cool. like fascinated by the idea yeah. <laughs> But uh, I, I didn't know enough about it or had enough experience that I invited Graham to help me, and we've had a great collaboration, uh, cool. Graham Resnick, um, uh, working on stuff, and we've made a few movies together. And So it's about uh, community. It's about not letting uh, the industry dictate what totally. your art is. I mean, that's what the YouTube is. That's what yeah. you're doing. You really have to... Uh, and if you get noticed, that's great. Or you just keep it with your community and you figure mm-hmm. it out. But uh, the the important thing is if you love the arts, um, that you be able to practice your and get right. better at what you're doing. You know, this is the thing I find so offensive. You know, being a filmmaker is so hard because you make a movie every four or five years yeah. or or whatever. And, you know, you get on set and you're like, now how does this work again? You know, right. you have to constantly be relearning. Whereas Same. most other arts you're building on experience or if you're a soccer player you know oh game last week i gotta remember to run wide or whatever you do and uh you know with filmmaking it's just like it's so arduous so that's why i encourage people to do stuff uh on their own at home and don't get too distracted by trying to be yeah you know the next and that's also nice because you stay you stay in the process so much longer Yes. Like through editing episodes, like more full circle versus piecing out after set and praying for the best. Like, <laughs> peace out. Yeah. Well, I, the other thing I feel like anyone who wants to be a director should edit. Uh, as I say, you don't have to edit your own movies. So that's a specific art form, but um, I'm kind of saying you do at first. Yeah. Because you've got to know. Oh, I shot it. And I thought I was getting this, but you know what? I should have gotten a close up here because this is such an important moment. Or, mm-hmm. or I just shot the shit out of this and I didn't really craft yeah. like the storyline. So now I'm doing it in the edit. But next time I shoot, I'm going to do it uh, this way because this is all I really needed anyway. Like a master totally. shot. People always think about master shots. Well, maybe you only need it for the very beginning of the scene, and therefore, don't keep running it anyway. All those no, that makes sense. A lot of stuff. It's also, I come from a theater background, so it's different, obviously, yeah. but something about um, knowing what all the jobs are and what they do. Exactly. So you can easier have an easier time collaborating with people who do exactly. those jobs. <laughs> right, and show them the respect because you know what they're going through. Like yeah. The art department. Everyone's job is hard. <laughs> Absolutely. Art department is the most overworked um, department. They've always got to be ahead of things. You know, things break, they got to fix them. So they have to be present on set, but thinking about the next yeah. day. And, uh, you know, the other thing is the DP, he's the most, or she is the absolute, uh, they, they work from the very beginning mm-hmm. to the very end of the day. They don't have a break. They can't yeah. walk away. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So, um, it's good to know all those people and to give them their, uh, respect and their space and understand their process, just like a good director has acted mm-hmm. or, or yeah. gone to acting class, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, because you got to know what the, the hell that is acting. It's a very vulnerable place, and you want to give people uh, space and respect and encouragement so they can actually be unexpected and spontaneous and all that good stuff. Okay, before I move on, where (laughs) can people see Depraved? (laughs) Well, uh, if you go to Depraved IFC, Mm -hmm. they will actually tell you if it's playing in your town. And, of course, what could be cooler than... um, 
seeing any movie in a in a theater experience. But uh, beyond that, it's still streaming, and probably hopefully we'll keep streaming. So whatever yeah. place you get your movies, it should be there. You'll find it. Yeah, yeah. It I came think... out on Friday the thirteenth. I know it was that great. That was fun. Yeah, I insisted. <laughs> I, I also think that there is something uh, to be said about horror movies specifically being seen in theaters. It's of like course, yeah. it's. It's meant to be a communal experience. It is, like of course. it's it's fun to like be scared next to the per- person next to you versus alone on your couch where you're like Am yeah. I scared? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's not well, the same. Same with comedy. It's all the same. It's all the same. Well the point is is movies are really fun. I mean, you know, having said that our screens are bigger at home and so, you know, the the home experience has gotten much better. It used sure. to be just like not even a question. But there's also a commitment level. Like I've known in my family uh, uh, for falling asleep in the movies when you know we're like oh it's after dinner fantastic oh my god I'm that's like Homer funny. Simpson uh, <laughs> but you go to a movie you don't fall asleep when you that's commit right. to the experience yeah. in the theater and it's like a full escape where it's like you have to turn your phone off you're oh my god dark, it's, it's profound yeah it's uh, to really different. just say I'm not gonna yeah engage with versus that. like I'm sort of like playing a game on my phone and barely watching the movie that's very bad I don't want to hear know. that I don't do it. <laughs> Except for once. I don't believe <laughs> Except for once, yeah. And then I learned my lesson. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't approve of the two-screen thing, even for the Oscars or whatever you might, no, you it's... know. It's just so... Uh, anyway, that's... I'm old school. I do want to ask about the orphanage. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so you were writing the the American... Ver- I love the orphanage. I think it's a oh, great movie. Absolutely. Um, so how did that how did that happen? <laughs> well, it was It's a pretty weird. big gig. <laughs> I mean... Um, Guillermo del Toro apparently specifically requested that I be the one to do it. Now, we had some interactions because I knew Ron Perlman, um, and Guillermo apparently had advocated for me years ago and insisted I win this award called the Someone to Watch Award. That's a spirit cool. award. So good. he had <laughs> his eye on me in some way, and uh, anyway, I got this call from an agent in Hollywood, and they said, do you have an agent? I said, no. And they said, do you want, I want to be your agent. And I was like, whoa, okay. Why? But that's a little <laughs> weird. You're calling Glass Eye Picks. I'm in a dungeon right now. And they're like, no, no, no. You're going to direct the orphanage. So that's how I heard. And then I wrote to Ron Perlman. I said, what, Ron, you're on set. He was making Hellboy too." I said, what's oh. going on? Ask Guillermo what's going on. I'm getting rumors, you know, before I'm even hearing from the real players. Anyway, Guillermo had handpicked me and we wrote the script together. Uh, it was a great experience. I learned a lot, you know, just working with a fellow artist who's mm-hmm. so well-versed in mythologies and uh, yeah. storylines and so on. Uh, but he also, it was also nice to see someone so respectful of whatever I had to offer. So we had a great, great. Uh, relationship and, uh, you know, he would tease me, fasten then, you know, you're an old wasp, you know. And I, you know <laughs> then he'd say, I'm a Mexican, I this and that. So, you know, he was really <laughs> awesome. just a fantastic. And, you know, it was weird as I was with him uh, in his uh, uh, house outside of L.A. And he was packing up to go make The Hobbit, which didn't work for him. Oh, wow. Uh, so that was very traumatic. <laughs> but he had yeah. a house filled with the most fantastic uh, tchotchkes. Oh, and, I bet. I mean, literally life-size Frankenstein sculptures and all this wonderful stuff. He's truly a lover of the arts and, of course, the dark arts. Um, uh, anyway, they ended up... We tried to cast for six, eight months. You know, he wanted the absolute top cream of the crop from Hollywood. Mm-hmm. And some of those gals probably thought they weren't quite sure who I was or why how they could entrust themselves to uh, working with me. So, you know, it was a lovely process. I met a lot of Hollywood people that I enjoyed, and I really looked forward to running a bigger crew because suddenly right. you're not as worried about money. or And you also, you don't have to think of everything. Right. Like when you work at the low budget, you have to know where the catering is and where the car parking is and, you yeah. know, what the next dramatic beat is. So this felt like it was going to be exciting to be protected from some of those things. But... Uh, eventually he called me fast and then listen we gotta we gotta find another director because I can't I can't oh, keep it going uh, yeah, we can't yeah. seem to cast it so I said okay man that's fine and I just wanted to see it made because totally. I did believe as great as the original is that we had made some really interesting uh, if you will alternative mm-hmm. uh, choices and and he and I really believed in the script and it was well liked by New Line yes. uh, and the sad thing is it wasn't made by the next guy either. 
back. So I don't know, everything in its time, but the heat went out of it. Yeah. Now it still exists, and it's a very Blumhouse type of movie, you totally. know, so it's a funny thing. Hey, they got plenty of money. <laughs> well, exactly. Although, who knows what Blumhouse thinks of me. But uh, anyway. That's what happened with the orphanage. But oh, it's just curious. Yeah, everybody assumes that I took a stand and I'm an indie guy against Hollywood. No, it wasn't like that at all. I would have loved to make that. Movie. Yeah. I, it's incredible to me that any movie gets made ever. <laughs> well, it's funny we're talking about Guillermo because he has the most sad quote that I think oh, no. is really uh, beautiful. He says, the natural state of a film is it's not getting made. And that's the real <laughs> truth. And, you know, he's lived it too. He wanted to make Mountains of Madness. Um and he fought for that. He had James Cameron and Tom Cruise as his collaborators, and somehow the studio decided that wasn't going to work out. Wow. <laughs> it's crazy. crazy. Uh, it's because he wanted an R rating for whatever reason, and it's just funny, you know, there, that's what I mean. Working with the industry mm-hmm. is a very specific experience, and it should be distinguished from you know, making art. Right, I, yeah. And you don't have to villainize the industry to make that point. It's just true. They're working on certain assumptions, yeah. uh, but the artist has to hold true to something else because that's the greater mission. And mm-hmm. when they overlap for a brief moment, seize it and make the movie. Something magic happens. Yeah. Happens. Exactly. Very cool. Very cool. I guess my last question for you is, uh, what's the deal with your band? Oh, uh, that's sweet. <laughs> it's just my friend. I play with him since '79. I think I met him uh, uh, in school, and I kind of learned the saxophone. Because I became enamored with the saxophone, and um, we write songs and sing, and we played out in the old days. We had a full band. We made a cool. couple records, played at uh, CBGBs and all that kind of history. The Pyramid Club, very cool. King Tut's very Wawa cool. had all that. So you know, we were just a working uh, sort of pub music. But actually, all those songs are in my film. So anyone who oh. has seen my movies kind of knows that melancholic, uh, sort of gritty. Um, singer songwriter vibe. That's my friend Tom Laver. Oh, that's uh, very cool. So you know, music is a is a great part of film, and it's a fun thing to do. And I never took it as it was supposed to be my destiny. So it wasn't so heartbreaking when things didn't happen. But we we had a good run. I'm a very intuitive bad sax player, but uh, <laughs> we make some noise. It's cool. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. My son is more talented than me, and he's a really good guitar player. And nice. He has a band. And What's his band? It's called Holiday right now, but they were called The Strangers for years, and they made all kinds of funny records where their voices hadn't even broken. But they're playing like <laughs> hard punk music, and nice. they're singing with little kid voices. That's amazing. Those are fun. <laughs> that's cool. That's cool. Well, thank you so much for uh, doing this interview. Yeah. And I'll link down in the description where you can find a parade, where you can find the Larry Gets Killed a Bunch of Times in a Row video, <laughs> yeah, and baby. the Frankenstein <laughs> compilation. Yeah. yeah, you're going to spend a Many whole links. evening with me. Yeah, let's go down the rabbit hole. <laughs> awesome. But uh, that's that. Cool. Thank Thanks you. Thanks a lot. It's really fun.